processed for the second consecutive year. Recipient of Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards for Outstanding Talk Show Series and Outstanding Public Affairs Series. of our McBean couple, it was a matter of necessity as they saw it, that they had their grandchild removed from the mother's home. The best way to say it, protecting uh, privacy and rights and, and uh, discrimination is that they had certain difficulties. Uh, in my client's case, the uh, fire manager interceded on the behalf of their grandchild, which they did to protect their best interests. 
Rogers University Social Work Department Chair Mark Rogers says that the role of the grandparent is important in cases like this one.
it's a good issue, and grandparents certainly do have rights, but obviously from my point of view as an advocate for children, I'm particularly concerned about the children's rights to have access to their grandparents. But that's not done just for, for a particular bias that the system itself well, well, says yeah. in the interest of the child come first. So whatever a grandparent thinks, a grandparent thinks may be particular in terms of what's best for the child. That's exactly right. And for the most part, children are dependent on the adults in their lives, so grandparents, their parents, other relatives, uh, government, uh, uh, social workers, or anyone to assert their interests. But really, be, because of that, the right of that particular adult individual when, as a matter of fact, you should be looking at the rights of the kids to have the, the fullest possible access to all the important people in their lives. Now, Carol, I'm so questioning the business document of the process because what I gave you for the student on the day of the 40,000 children who were raised by grandparents in terms of the broader issue, uh, you mentioned that you think the numbers are even larger than that. Yes, the number is a, is a number of children whose grandparents have no formal custody um, in that sort of state where grandparents have informal custody of the children. That, that number, when you think about it, the number of people who have ease or involvement in raising children without any formal orders could be as large as the number of kids with formal orders in the United States. That's correct. There are millions of families in the country where grandparents are the primary caregivers of their grandchildren. And what is the family? What is the goal of the job? Salvation Army's program has been interacting with families and their grandparents. Several years ago, caseworkers at Salvation Army recognized that many of their clients that they came to the Salvation Army for emergency service um, is a group of grandchildren. They were grandparents who were really raising their grandparents. So we became aware of the special problems and special needs of this population. So we designed and implemented a plan to family program that focuses on the psychological, emotional, and social needs of both the grandparents, the custodial grandparent, and some of the needs of the grandchildren. Now, did you have any examples from the work or even from your reading of the brief that in a case where a parent may be dysfunctional, uh, may be under substance abuse, may be mentally ill, and some of them may not even be here, that that's an appropriate situation for a grandparent to work with? You know, assume a large group who may be not fully assumed in custody, but who may be supervising being deeply involved. The other end of the spectrum are cases you hear about in which parents are helping the worker and have some difference. Maybe there's a difference on the child parent and the grandparents and say, we don't want them telling us every day that this child should worship in this church or be a part of this group or have this particular approach to a health care problem. That we don't want our parents to be doing that. Why isn't that the correct decision as opposed to what it was the goal? Well, to a large extent, it is the goal of the decision. The, uh, the strength of the parent power over the life of their children is as strong a presumption as we have in the law. The uh, situation that the grandparent faces in that kind of a situation is, is that they have to present arguments why this may be harmful. For the most part, I would say that uh, a lot of evidence as to whether or not that may be harmful may be in the mind of the child. And I'm, I wonder why in so many of those cases we don't turn to the child to find out what his or her preferences are. Are you with the uh, Virginia Tech? That is correct. Um, actually, you know, one can't get to the kids but the child. The child or patient does not take the lead into account at all. Well, they're supposed to. And I think that that's part of the problem is that we have lots of provisions in our law and certainly in the minds of the people who have to make these decisions that we're going to ask the child what he or she wants. What we don't have is a real strong understanding of how important that is and that um, it certainly is something that uh, may or may not have influence in a particular case. Is danger not that as a New Jersey city we can fight with the parents and grandparents over judge wants to talk to the child, is the equivalent of a nine-year-old in a carrot game with a, with a rifle. And is this age a factor by which a judge will determine how 
simply a matter of if it gets a matter of maturity. And I must say that in my career of representing the Office of Director of Children, I've talked to some five-year-olds who not only know what they want, but they know why they want it. So I would say that obviously for that child, uh, listening is very important to the parents. There may be uh, there may be a lot of truth and a lot of important guidance in what the child has to say. But Kelly, you must from time to time see families and caregivers that come and they see tension. And I would imagine in a child in this situation, there is tension that might be to a certain extent not quite typical for them to talk about in front of everybody. Yes, we do see families um, where there is tension. Um, many of the families that we work with, grandparents have legal custody because of the use and effect um, of visitation and drugs. But many of the biological parents of the children are still using the drugs. So the grandparents who are raising the children strong feeling on the part of the child that that's an appropriate place to be. Now, in addition to the child as well, the statute, for example, seems to favor those who at one time or another have had a victim or custodial relationship with the child. Is that likely to be here in modern day America? I would hope so, actually, because when you think about it, in terms of this whole area, but even the broader area of the law relating to the responsibility and the involvement of, of relatives, strong family friends in developing a child, the key factor that we're looking for as child advocates is that these are people who have significance in the life of the child. So the factor of having been a caregiver before is obviously a major indicator that there is a strong relationship, a relationship that has some real provable identity to it. This child was in this person's care, uh, therefore it's not going to be a place that you're a stranger. And I must say that we have seen in our work uh, certainly a substantial number of cases where an argument is made for placing a child, in the case of the Webb case, with a relative who turns out to be a total stranger to the child. Yes, indeed, there's some kinship relationship, but this child's never met the person. And, and obviously, from the point of view of the child's advocate, there has to be a great deal of concern about that. Carol, when I read uh, the Stone Ledger, which is the Kelly Clark Post, and other New York Times, social issues being discussed, and from time to time I get involved in lobbying on various issues for various organizations and the like. This is not an issue that seems to be always on the front page or about the lips of legislators and lobbyists. That is the question, how do we deal with increasing numbers of grandparents who are raising children? Is it one that is getting all the attention from government and from state? It is getting more attention from government than it had previously. In New Jersey, it's getting more attention. Disparity um, between income received by foster or foster care minors and grandparents who are raising their grandchildren is a great issue that is getting um, attention uh, between the state and the grandparent caregivers. And why is that getting it? Well, the state feels that kinship care, which has been proposed. Um, sense to give money to a relative if they have the appearance of a relationship with a stranger. Why is that? It does make sense. Um, the cost of the school may be in the state of New Jersey, and the states is concerned that there will be abuses of the system if they give grandparents or kinship care providers stipends, even if they do not give foster care providers 
perspectives. Um, however, we find in advocating for grandparents raising their grandchildren that the grandparents aren't receiving kinship care. They're not aware it exists. Um, they're sent to welfare to receive wel welfare stipends for the grandchildren. So you need to look at the effect of something like kinship to make it to the communities that are important to them. Why, why, why is that a common factor? And why do you think that those in the job that may be in 25 years face challenging situations like this? And then you are looking at the job that you might be in 50 years. Do you know about many trips to have a family that you can be on a ticket for the child? The child is going to be very vulnerable sometimes in education for children that are complex activities. Almost always complex. It may be very simplistic sounding, but the most important thing you have to do in order to ensure that you're effectively implicating the child in us is to talk to the child. It's absolutely remarkable to me the number of people who make decisions about children's lives who don't take the time to actually talk to the child. Uh, obviously, different children, the same thing is true of, of uh, different adults as well, uh, have a different way of expressing themselves, and you have to filter what you're listening to and try to make some sense out of it. But it's extremely important and vitally important, I dare say, that the courts, and in this case, it's ultimately the government, to listen, to actively listen to what the child has to say. But then there are a lot of kids that you can't talk to that are unable because of uh, being way too young or having some other reason to talk to the child. And then really what you have to do is try to uh, figure out what a child would want in these kinds of circumstances recognizing some pretty basic principles, like the one we talked about before, that it's better to be with somebody you know and are comfortable with than somebody that you don't know and are not comfortable with. But this is the key thing that I think might change, correct? No longer the kind of voice that's been disrupted. And as society looks at it, what would you think would change? Well, that's a very tough question. I should have one at the tip of my tongue, and I don't. I think that principle that needs to be uh, held as paramount in the whole area of what we refer to as domestic relations law is figuring out a way to get across what the child's wishes are or would be if they're in a position to express it. Not necessarily that those wishes will govern them, because I've had kids tell me they want things that I know are not going to be ordered by a judge, they're not safe. But they have to be done because you have to try to translate what is ultimately going to be the decision into terms that a child can understand, uh, getting as close as possible to what they think would be the right result. Carol, you told me that you have five to seven generations of family members in this program. Anything you would like to see change in the world? Yeah, I'd like to see New Jersey take kinship care more seriously and do something for our kinship care providers in the state. Let's hope the legislature is listening to us. Yes, yeah. Thanks for asking us. Good job. Thank you, Carol. I want to thank you, Kevin, for this uh, very informative discussion. That's it for this edition of Due Process. But join us next week for another document review of the law and the local law and social justice. Until then, from all of us here at Due Process, thank you. something.
major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual.